Everybody can hear me? Thank you. Um, when um, David called me about speaking at this seminar, I was uh, standing outside the Sex Museum in New York City, and I said, yeah, I got to do this. This is not <laughs> coincidental. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but I was really interested to listen to, to uh, James talk about sexual deviancy and thought of the many times and cases that I've been in where we get mired into this subject for no good reason other than uh, its prejudicial value to the judge. Uh, or <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is essentially shaming the parties or counsel into, in the form of intimidation. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, the, the, the path that I've tread is that I worked with my mother from, she graduated in 1936. And in those days, uh, <clears throat> she did probate, trust, real estate. But in the 50s, she got drafted into family law because women needed an advocate. <clears throat> and those uh, women uh, needed to be able to trust a, a woman advocate. So uh, there she was, and, and uh, she was very popular. And she was very good at proving adultery, abandonment, neglect. <clears throat> it was really kind of one of her favorite things to do, and she, she, she got into it. When in the 70s it became a no-fault state, she went to Olympia and uh, opposed it because she didn't think that women would be treated fairly uh, under a no-fault system. Uh, so <clears throat> she, would, she would worm fault into trials one way or another uh, because she just thought that, you know, the circumstances of the divorce needed to be uh, <clears throat> told. And she had uh, no qualms about slapping somebody with an alienation of affections action if she found a girlfriend or a boyfriend who had uh, broken up a marriage. I mean, that was just her style of advocacy, and it was very aggressive. So <clears throat> now we're looking at all this is about whether or not this approach should violate the rules of professional conduct. Um, and so that's how uh, I want to dive into this. And <clears throat> I, I believe that it is, that what I'm talking about is aspirational. But in the, in the time of the Me Too movement, uh, I think it is time to do this, have this discussion, particularly in the area of family law. So am I going to go in the right direction? So we have a separation or divorce, and the question is, um, <clears throat> are there facts of sexual misconduct present in the case? The truth of which is not denied. So I could, I could regale you with horror stories or give you examples of situations that get introduced in cases, and I, but I just don't want to do that, because any factual situation that I'm going to give you 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 know you can justify it or talk around it or maybe it was relevant or not relevant, but I <clears throat> so I really want you to just step back and think about a case in which you had a client where this information was introduced and it wasn't relevant and um, and your imagination is uh, as good as mine uh, and and I I have a few examples I'll get to later but what's happening is that. <clears throat> There are feelings of betrayal, uh, jealousy, uh, abandonment, and retribution and revenge. So my mother thought it was very important for people to be able to go to court and tell that story and get it out of their system and have that be part of the healing process of the divorce case. <clears throat> we have therapists now. We have other means of doing that. Um, so, uh, but it still is going on. Um, the feelings of the client is authentic, and there is some idea that in mediation or in trial you should have that moment, and it does happen. Um, but a lot of this depends on where you're coming from in a dissolution case. If you're doing it to shame, embarrass, or prejudice, uh, in sh shame or embarrass counsel or the <clears throat> client, that's not good. If you're doing it to prejudice the judge or to push his buttons, that's not good. If the person on the witness stand is having their moment in a difficult divorce trial, well, that happens, and hopefully the judge can look past some of that. But um, what I want to talk about is intentional use of this. Um, <clears throat> so what are the legal issues in the case? What information is material to the facts in the dispute? 
and ethically what restraint should we be u using in the introduction of this information. So <clears throat> the issues in the case can include a residential schedule for minor children, restrictions on the time uh, that the, ch the children spend with uh, that, uh, a parent, the safety and well-being of the child, their best interests, property division, sex and property division. I do have some examples of that, and maintenance. Uh, <clears throat> and borrow a line from Tina Turner, what's love got to do with any of those, <laughs> with any of those subjects? Um, so I got to keep up with my, yeah. Um, There we go. And I want to keep the terminology straight. So as we sift through all the uh, information, we need to find what's material and admissible evidence. So the definition of information would be uh, information consists of facts learned about someone or something. Um, now, Evidence is the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. So we get a lot of information, uh, but whether or not something uh, is material, that's the key in, in this presentation. Admissible evidence is composed of facts that are material, not overly prejudicial and reliable. And that's, that's not a quote from ER 401 or ER 403. Those are just uh, English language. Uh, 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 definitions, but what uh, we're looking at is I don't want to just lump when we talk about, I want to use the terms specifically. We get a lot of information, but whether or not it's evidence or not, I don't want to just say this is evidence. What we get is a ton of information and we want to parse through what is really evidence to prove or disprove a material fact at issue in the case in one of the, can in one of the categories that I talked about. Um, and when I'm talking about the information we're receiving, I'm not talking about uh, criminal information. Uh, that information, you can't restrain the use of it. You have to use it. It has to be put forward. So I don't want anybody to misinterpret what I'm talking about here as uh, information related to domestic violence, abuse, rape, sexual harassment uh, that, that's going to come forward. I'm not advocating not using that. And <clears throat> marital rape is a crime. Uh, there must always be consent between the partners at all times, uh, as David mentioned. Um, <clears throat> if both participants agree that, the, agree that they're having sex, that consent can stop at any time. So uh, information comes in during a divorce case about this subject, um, I'm not suggesting that it not come into evidence. It, it, it has to come into evidence <clears throat> if there's protection orders or restraining orders that are being pursued. Um, so what I want to do is raise awareness about a particular issue. I wonder if I could get my water back there. I think it's that little bottle on the stand. So I want, oh, thanks. So I want to raise uh, awareness about this particular issue, about shaming tactics. And I'll get to why I think this is important uh, in the field of family law. But it, it, it comes up routinely. And thank you. It comes up routinely as simple as shame on you. Now, I have gotten letters from opposing counsel saying shame on you for what I'm doing. So we're all tough. We're litigators, right? We can just push that stuff off. Doesn't bother you, doesn't bother me. But, but I'll make the case that it does bother us. And when you get into high conflict divorce cases, particularly with some members of the bar, it's constant uh, and it's, it, it wears you out. <clears throat> now, you are going to want to protect your client from those kinds of tactics. Um, 
and, and we do that as readily as we can. But it's still, when we're in the, involved in this subject matter, in the family law case, um, uh, it, it's wearing. Um, comments, cases we get involved in is, you're a neglectful parent. That's supposed to mean something in terms of money or residential schedules or I'm, I'm a victim in the case. Uh, one parent makes that allegation against the other. Disclosing highly personal details about sexual conduct uh, is their expression of their feelings of betrayal. That's supposed to make some difference about money and how the emotional shift from being married to not married is going to um, impact them. But it is, it is used to shame the other party in the process of the divorce. So um, my point here today is <clears throat> shaming is not a benign tactic. Uh, it's intentional. And the question is, think about in your advocacy whether or not you use shaming as a judgment because that's what lawyers do. I mean, that's what the law is about. We're making decisions and we're, we're passing judgments on people. So is that advocacy? Why do we say those things? Uh, how do we justify making these statements to each other? And it comes, you can tell in the case, it'll come early in the motions or in the declarations when somebody wants to make that initial impression on the motion calendar that I'm the good guy, that's the bad guy, and this is going to be a rugged road and you better uh, uh, negotiate with me or uh, you're going to regret it. It comes in the form of letters, sort of a constant onslaught of allegations and recriminations. Um, <clears throat> and in, t in terms of uh, sensitivity about workplace environment, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> say a man tells a joke in a room filled with men and one woman. Now the joke he tells, he didn't intend it to be anything but funny. But, so, but the woman may feel all of a sudden isolated from the group because she didn't get it, she didn't laugh, she's not part of the group, and that, that creates uh, uh, an unpleasant environment. So the way we think about those things now is you don't say, hey, I didn't mean anything by that. I mean, I could sit up here and start telling Scandinavian jokes. I'd think they were funny. Uh, James may not. So wh whenever you're into uh, this kind of situation, writing a letter, writing a declaration, going into court, you really do need to think about, how am I going to impact opposing counsel? How am I going to impact uh, the other parent, the other client? I can make these allegations, but really think ahead is that how is it going to hit? Is it going to progress my case? Why am I doing it? Where am I coming from? Uh, I think about those things <clears throat> a lot because I do want to resolve cases. I, I don't want to inflame them, uh, and people should be able to move on. So why is shaming used? Domestic violence is about control. Uh, shaming is also about control. We use shame to intimidate because shame essentially is the painful belief that I'm defective as a human being, I will not be accepted, and I do not belong, and I'm not worthy of respect, and ultimately in a divorce case it's I don't deserve the money. I don't deserve my children, I don't deserve anything, so if you pepper it and you use it effectively you can really push a settlement uh, you can uh, uh, impact the case in a lot of different ways. That's why people use shaming. All right, it's not that they get to feel superior, like I understand what's going on here, you should be ashamed for what you're doing. How can you represent those kinds of people? Don't you know what it is, the, the harm that you're causing everybody? So, but as an attorney representing somebody, that's my job. I'm going to represent them. Uh, so don't shame me, but it happens. It goes on and on and on. <clears throat> if members of the family law bar, <clears throat> it's subtle. It comes through in letters. Um, uh, I've been, I've had letters that say, um, uh, you've lost your objectivity in this case. You're much too close to your client. 
uh, you're not being reasoned about things. <clears throat> My letters back usually in that regard are, <clears throat> well, that's a projection with, with which I just don't identify. <laughs> I didn't get a letter back on that one. <laughs> Um, but if you're like me, when I, when I get those in the declarations about my client or, my, or letters to me, I, can, I feel it in my body. I have a sick feeling because it really does go to uh, your self-worth, your very sense of existence. So <clears throat> we, could, we could break into little groups of two here and we could share some shaming experiences, right? I'm not going to make you do that. <laughs> but if just for a second there you thought, oh, what would I talk about? How did I feel? Then you, you're going to get there um, <clears throat> about why this is serious. It's not benign. So um, <clears throat> a quote that I think is on point. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, Scandinavian, uh, one of my philosophical heroes, uh, he put it this way, and this is about how subtle what I'm talking about is. The greatest hazard of all, losing the self, can occur very quietly in the world as if we're nothing at all. No other loss can occur so quietly. Any other loss, an arm, a leg, five dollars, a wife, etc., is sure to be noticed. So the damage about what we're talking about and shaming tactics or practices is subtle. It does wear on us as attorneys and it does uh, affect our job. Uh, and we need to wake up to the fact that you don't just man up about this stuff. You don't just say, eh, I can take it. I, I do think that something. it's time to do something about it. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, cumulative damage to our client, cumulative damage to us, and it's cumulative damage to the judicial system because the process is using shame is not based in reason and logic, and the judicial system is based in reason and logic. <clears throat> so statistics are the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation, American Bar Association, Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs, recent study that 21% of practicing lawyers qualify as problem drinkers, 28% struggle with depression, and 19% demonstrate symptoms of anxiety. <clears throat> Could that be because that's the way we treat each other? And maybe I'm just talking about the family law bar. <clears throat> uh, I'm always... Uh, 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 jealous of the plaintiff's bar because they'll get along together and they go on trips and conferences and things like that and it's a little more problematic for the family law bar because they're always up against each other but <clears throat> there's no one-to-one -one correlation in what I'm talking about but I'm, cer I'm certain that the pressure of what I'm talking about is present here in terms of how lawyers are trying to navigate <clears throat> this difficult area so the question is, what's the response to shame? Uh, <clears throat> the response to shame is compassion. So <clears throat> the reason I'm feeling shame is because I'm a human being and I have those feelings. And if somebody's touched my buttons in some way <clears throat> that they didn't know but it worked, I need to have compassion for myself. And when I'm thinking about the shamer, the issue needs to be they feel superior for a moment while they're doing that, but that's not a position of strength. So my compassion for them is there must be some area of anxiety that they're experiencing uh, <clears throat> that I can feel uh, compassion for them about. So that's the best weapon for shaming, and uh, I will tie that into what I believe sanctions should be uh, if somebody has violated the rules of professional conduct using these kinds of tactics. So we're going to go through <clears throat> the rules regarding uh, reporting professional misconduct, 8.4 misconduct described, and then where I believe some of these tactics uh, do violate 
the RPCs. And uh, that's 3.1, 3.2, all the way down through 4.4. Uh, these are my personal experiences. Um, and <clears throat> I want to make the point that I'm not talking about evidence rules here. I'm not talking about how do we exclude evidence f that's immaterial from trial. I'm really talking about when information is being used in a case uh, that violate the RPCs, uh, how do we address it? So why wouldn't you just use the, RP or the evidence rules? Because that's typically what we do, right? We know everything's coming in. We're going to wait for trial, and we'll exclude it, and, that, and we'll win, and that'll be good. Uh, <clears throat> we, we rely on the no-fault provisions of 2609, 080, and 090, um, and that's typically how these things are handled. Uh, so I'm suggesting a different approach. And it's the kind of case that you're in where the opposing side is just using the what sticks approach. I mean, they're just going to throw everything at it. Uh, prejudicial information that's not material to the disputed facts or issues. Um, now, like us, when we're confronted with this information, judges don't protect themselves. Now, when the information comes in, um, uh, a judge can exclude it. A jury will never hear it. But the judge hears it and has to rule on it. And they'll say, well, I'm excluding it. It's prejudicial. It's not material. But they've heard it. The judge can't unring the bell. Now, he'll tell you, or she, uh, I'm good at this. I'm going to rise above all that, um, and uh, I can sort through that. But they can't. They're humans. And the way that shaming in the courtroom is effective, it's effective in the judge, not in an unconscious judge, but uh, subconsciously, as a typo. <laughs> so, but subconsciously, it's present in the room. I have had unconscious judges before. <laughs> uh, there, was one, there was a judge year, years ago that he would drink at lunch. There were two restaurants right across the street from the courthouse, and he'd come back drunk. And he'd be going to sleep about 2 o'clock, 2.30. Probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, so I'd always keep a stack of books on the edge. And when I got to the part of the testimony that was really important, I'd knock the books off and he'd wake up. <laughs> and then I'd look right at him. The witness is over here and I'd just say, and I'd ask my question, and then I'd look at the witness and the answer, and he'd look over and say, why are you looking at me? And then I'd get that done and then I'd just go back to it and he'd go back to sleep. So it was just a matter of keeping him awake. But, but I don't think judges appreciate uh, uh, how this information comes in and, and taints them. So um, I want to raise the red flag. Uh, in a case, I'm suggesting that when you, you know it's coming because you know the characters uh, that use this, this tactic, but when you see it coming in early, uh, start early. So if you're going to consider using the RPCs in this way, um, don't wait until the end. A lot of times what we do is <clears throat> we'll say, oh, I'm going to see how the case turns out in the end, then I'll report the misconduct. I, I, I think that's the wrong way to think about this, because <clears throat> I've been in those shoes too many times. And of course you don't, the case moves on. Um, <clears throat> what you're afraid of is if you report the violation during the pendency of the case, the other side will use that as a counter tactic and say, hey, look at the dirty tricks they're doing. They reported uh, this and complained to the bar. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the uh, and then the, the judge can just say, well, it's two lawyers don't get along together. So what? I'm not going to do anything about it. But I think the better argument there is to say uh, to, the, um, to the judge, that is a separate jurisdiction. That's a separate area. You don't need to concern yourself of that. Just as when there's a violation of the RPCs, that's not law in the case, and it, and it doesn't get involved in the, the, how this case is decided. Let the two things do their own thing. And uh, <clears throat> I think if you make the argument well, um, you shouldn't worry about it. And the judge shouldn't be a part of that or consider it as bad practice. What I'm trying to do here is 
I'm not using the RPCs as a way to exclude evidence. But if early in the case, you're saying, talk to counsel and say, look, you've got this information. It's not material to the case. Why are you using it? And put them on notice of it and what you think about it. Uh, and then maybe that will uh, uh, call that information out a little more during the progress of the case. But I'm saying be proactive about it. Um, is the opposing counsel using this as a dog whistle, uh, <clears throat> immaterial information? So uh, I cited a couple cases here where uh, the evidence is likely to stimulate an emotional response rather than a rational decision. Um, a jury's emotions can be so inflamed by a perceived showing of racism that the jury used emotion rather than reason as a basis for conviction. I just think as stated, that's a lot better argument than saying, well, Your Honor, it's a no-fault state. I don't think that's a good argument. I've made it too many times, and the judge says, yeah, yeah, uh, and you move on. So um, I don't know if it ever get to the point where you'd ask the judge to recuse themselves because the information in the case has been so uh, emotional or vitriolic. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I would look. There have been cases in the past I would have liked to have tried that, but in a bench trial, I'm not certain if that's doable. Um, so what's the motivation for <clears throat> anyone using these kinds of tactics these days? Now, the RPC about advocacy is that we're going to use, that the attorney has to, re has to use, should use reasonable diligence and prompt advocacy. Uh, the preamble to the RPC states there's a special responsibility for the quality of justice. A lawyer can be conscientious and ardent advocate and the lawyer's obligation conscientiously and ardently to protect uh, while maintaining courteous and civil attitude. So I, I really think those words should be used a lot in the process. Uh, with, in talking to the judge about your concerns about this material, if it comes up that there's an RPC violation, or in talking to opposing counsel. Um, but what, what the shame, people who use shaming believe that uh, zealous advocacy justifies the, the use of shaming. But <clears throat> zealous advocacy is no longer the rule. It was replaced with the current RPC. Um, uh, a little bit of research. Uh, this statement was <clears throat> the best articulated reason for use of, adv of zealous advocacy is Lord uh, Brougham in 1820 in the trial of Queen Carolyn. Uh, and now, so I'm talking family law. So it's just a different environment, right? I must not re regard the alarm or the suffering, the torment, or even the destruction I may bring upon another. Nay, separating the duties of a patriot from those of an advocate, I must go on re reckless of the consequences. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think in a family law case, I just don't think that the zealous advocacy rule fits. What's interesting about this case is that it is a family law case. It's uh, <clears throat> King George IV was illegally married to Maria Fitzherbert, uh, and he, but he was betrothed to Carolyn of Brunswick uh, prior to his illegal marriage to um, Maria. And when it was time for his coronation, he wanted to get rid of Carolyn. So he trotted out in a trial all of Carolyn's alleged affairs uh, in terms of her um, time she spent in Italy when she was estranged and he pushed out of the country. So <clears throat> it is a family law case. The issues were what is the future of, of Britain going to be and who's going to be king and do I get a divorce from Carolyn? So <clears throat> um, we've moved away from that culture. So in the family law bar culture, what is the culture of the bar? Is it civil, collegial? Uh, Settlement conferences, caucusing. Um, 
mediations kind of came on board in the late 80s. Uh, there was, you, if you got assigned a trial date, it was two years out. Thank you. Uh, it was two years out, and so there was a thing called uh, breaking the log jam, and Ken LeMaster led this whole mediation bit, which is now mandatory. But prior to the mediation years, uh, we actually had to talk to each other to settle cases. We wrote letters, we met, we talked on the phone. It was unpleasant sometimes that there was real interaction. Uh, I think a disservice that's gone on in mediation, which I also call settlement conferences, is that we don't talk to each other anymore. Caucusing is the default mode. You walk in one room, they walk in another room, and we never talk to each other as attorneys. So. Uh, I really think there should some, be some reversal on that where the parties, they're going to be together in the same courtroom if you don't settle a case. I think they can sit together in the same room for a few minutes if there's no abuse or protection orders involved and have, have some dialogue. So I'd like to see that reintroduced. I suggest it to mediators uh, all the time and they look at me like I'm crazy because they don't want to manage the emotional nightmare that's going to happen when all those people get in the same room. Um, but <clears throat> I think it would be better, at least for counsel, to spend time in the same room talking to each other and practice some of those things. Because otherwise, we're just off shooting letters at each other uh, and um, uh, impersonal letters to each other. And <clears throat> how did we get here? What's going on? So. Is it trickle up or is it trickle down where we're at in our country today? I don't know. I think it's a trickle up. Um, but uh, Michael Murphy is a Republican consultant for Mitt Romney and <clears throat> Jeb Bush and George Bush. And he put it this way, we've moved from a culture, from the culture politics of I'm right, you're wrong, to the culture of I'm right, you're evil, and therefore, anything goes. When you're evil, anything goes in opposing you. It starts as a reasonable conclusion, but it leads to corruption. So I do get the sense in family law cases that it's turned into a I'm right, you're evil environment. And um, <clears throat> it should be I'm right, you're wrong, the judge will decide. That's the process. That's why we're here. Now let's get to the evidence. Uh, and you can have your evidence, I'll have mine. Where it's, I'm right, you're evil, then the bad tactics come out. Uh, and I think that's where the, um, uh, the shaming tactics come in. Um, <clears throat> so what's our duty to report? Uh, RPC 8.3, um, it's important to keep this into context because the question is, what are we preserving here? What we're preserving is that our legal profession is self-governing. That's unique. Uh, to the extent that lawyers meet the obligation of their professional calling, the occasion for government regulation is obviated. If you can imagine Washington, D.C. trying to regulate uh, the law profession. So uh, we, we're the ones that preserve it. Uh, Self-regulation also helps maintain the legal profession's independence from gov government domina domination and the legal profession's relative autonomy carries with it special responsibilities of self-government. So <clears throat> it's just on us. Um, <clears throat> there's a, I heard recently on NPR somebody talking about horizontal healing. And that's born out of the concept that of horizontal violence of, in the nursing industry. And it was described as there was so much pressure from the top down and there was nothing anybody could do about it uh, uh, to remedy things going up, so the violence went laterally. Uh, and that's uh, expressed in abusive conduct towards uh, coworkers. So the Me Too movement has adopted a, a lateral, uh, a horizontal healing approach. There's nothing we can do to make things better at the top. That's just not going to happen. So what's happened in the Me Too movement is people have gone laterally in that we can help ourselves in our healing with, with talking about what's going on in the environment right around us. 
So I think that's what attorney to attorney in, the, in our profession uh, we need to do. Um, the <coughs> rules of professional conduct state that every lawyer is responsible for observance of rules of professional conduct. A lawyer should also aid in securing their observance by other practitioners, and neglect of these responsibilities compromises the independence of the profession and the public interest it serves. So, feel the obligation. Uh, it's really there, and it's good to be reminded of it. Um, <clears throat> the RPCs also state, uh, there should be an obligation to report even isolated incidents of shaming because, the, well, the RPCs don't say that, but report isolated incidents of misconduct uh, because it could lead to a discovery of a pattern of conduct. So just because you're seeing something once doesn't mean it's not going on a lot. Um, so um, <clears throat> that's no reason not to report. So <clears throat> misconduct. Um, I've only set forth several of the items here in the slides, but um, uh, a lawyer engages in misconduct when he, engages, when he or she engages in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. Um, my point here is that, you know, let's say the facts are undisputed there's sec and we've been talking about sexual conduct here. It's going to work its way into the trial for some reason. The issue is, is it material under Evidence Rule 401? Does it tend to prove or disprove a facted issue that's relevant to the case, to the resolution of the case? If it's not, why are you introducing it? Well, I didn't know. I think I'd just try. I'm a zealot advocacy. I'm not sure. You know, let me just do this. And I think the obligation here is when you're, when you're uh, engaging in this conduct of misrepresentation, misrepresentation is you're representing to the court that it's material. That's a misrepresentation. And you're doing it intentionally. And the pattern is out throughout the case. So I like that argument in saying, not just saying, look, Your Honor, it's not relevant. Because it's having an impact on the judge. Uh, or, but I'm sorry, so now I'm back in trial mode. <clears throat> Let's stay back in RPC mode. So if, you, if, if my complaint to the bar is, look, they're, they're knowingly introducing personal, confidential, embarrassing, shaming evidence as a method of controlling uh, or intimidating people in the process. And that's, that's incorrect, and they violated 8.4. Um, D is engages in conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice. If, if you're doing this and you're escalating the dispute and there are children involved, I think that's also potentially uh, uh, a violation of the rule. H is... Uh, in representing a client engaging conduct that is prejudicial to the administration of justice towards judges, lawyers, or LLLTs, or parties, witnesses, that a reasonable person would interpret as manifesting prejudice or bias on the basis of sex, sexual orientation. Can we expand that to uh, private sexual uh, preferences or uh, practices? W why is this coming in? Uh, and that's coming in because <clears throat> it's being improperly used. Um, uh, rule 3.1, meritorious claims and contentions. A lawyer shall not bring or defend a proceeding or assert or controvert an issue therein unless there is a basis in law and fact for doing so that is not frivolous. So again, we're talking about is it material? Um, a basis in law and fact that is not frivolous. If it's not material, you violated this rule. It's where you're coming from. Um, the Queen, Queen Carolyn's case was, there was evidence introduced of adultery uh, with a low-born man um, <clears throat> as to why she wasn't fit to be queen. 
so she was denied her uh, coronation. Uh, she did show up at the coronation and she was barred from entering uh, the church and she committed suicide. So when you say there's no consequences to the tactic, there are consequences to the tactic. Um, I, I'll give you an example of um, <clears throat> the decision whether to use this information or not came in in the case. And uh, <clears throat> one of the spouses had built a BDSM chamber in their, in their storage unit. And <clears throat> so they were using that, and, it, and, and of course it was betrayal. It was uh, not a good marriage. They hadn't been in love for 10 years or so, and that was that spouse's activity. Uh, so that all came out. The children have never been exposed to that activity. It was all quite contained in the storage unit. But there was a sense of betrayal, uh, and uh, that's bubbling up. Now, do you use that? I mean, what's it got to do with property or restrictions for the children or anything? It was just a, a choice of one spouse. So think long and hard about whether or not that comes into evidence. There was a $300 a month non-use for a community benefit. So <clears throat> if, that, if, if the person who's engaged in the, in the conduct that is um, being used as shaming fesses up to that and says, look, I spent $5,000 that didn't benefit the community. I admit that. That's the relevant portion of it. Does the rest of the story need to come in for that purpose? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> and, if, uh, and if it's where it's coming from is to shame and intimidate the individual so they don't go to court or they feel bad about their family uh, and to get a settlement, then I think that's wrong. Um, Uh, using information that um, complicates the case. So rule 3.2, a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to expedite lit litigation consistent with the interests of the client. I like it that the language is positive, not negative, because we always say you, can't, you shouldn't delay the case. You have to make uh, efforts to expedite the litigation. So if you bring in a lot of information that has to do with sexual conduct and you confuse the commissioner on the initial uh, hearing, then you're running the risk of having experts appointed like Dr. Olson uh, and parenting evaluators. And if you've ever been in one of those hearings where they just bring out the hose and they spray the whole room with every kind of allegation uh, it's, it's, it's abhorrent. And typically, it w uh, my approach has always been, look, <clears throat> uh, the children are not at risk. We'll go through every evaluation you want. We'll, we'll, we'll cover all these bases, and we'll go through the whole process and get to the end. And that's the best way to take care of it. But I don't think so, because typically, the client ends up with $30,000 in evaluation fees that they need to pay because they have to defend against the allegations. So proacting would be, look, this isn't material, and maybe we should consider uh, reporting to the bar this level of activity as, as another way of protecting your client. Um, candor towards the tribunal is the same thing. You need to represent to the court that the information you're, you're, you're offering is material. And if it's not material, uh, I, I believe you're violating this, uh, uh, this RPC. Um, the information has to be material fact to the tribunal. Um, I just, I, I can't imagine if somebody's uh, buying sexual robots and doing those kinds of things and uh, the sense of adultery and all that, how I just, it boggles my mind to think how that's going to play out in the future. Or if you're playing VR games uh, with those kind of activities going on, uh, how that's going to play out in, in cases. 
as why that's relevant or material, but what we will see. Um, so fairness to opposing counsel is you can't obstruct other parties' access to evidence. Um, now, um, examples of misconduct would be, uh, <coughs> I've experienced this when I'm taking a deposition. I'm, I'm entitled under the RPC to access to evidence. So I'm taking a deposition, I'm asking questions, and I'm getting non-responsive answers. Um, and the, uh, the deponent, the witness, wants to talk about, they'll, they'll just segue over into the, the, the bad conduct, as whether it's they can't work, uh, they've lost money, whatever it is, the children are at risk, but we're always back in that subject. Uh, and my objection is, in the deposition, is your answer is not responsive, please answer the question. And the opposing counsel under 30 HD2 is supposed to not object. But the response always is, look, let the witness finish the answer, which I think violates 30 HD2 because that's a speaking objection, and the witness is encouraged then to go on, and I'm looking like the one who's, who's not providing time for answers. But it, what happens is the deposition is so junked up with non-material allegations that I can't use it at, for, at trial for impeachment. Um, and I ask, oh, really? Did I miss a couple of those? Um, so let me just hit one point here. Um, treating physicians and experts. Um, if you, if you go to your, your treating physician and you talk them into stating an opinion about a residential schedule, uh, an expert opinion about that, they're a treating physician, they're not an evaluated physician, and you're putting them in a position of uh, violating their own rules. So um, respect for rights of third persons is the same thing. You need to understand where you're putting somebody in a compromising situation. So, um, there are standards set forth in the Washington Administrative Code about a parenting evaluation. If you encourage a treating person, uh, treating mental health professional or medical professional to cross the lines from treating into expert, uh, you're asking them to violate the Washington Administrative Code as well as uh, uh, maybe their own uh, standards in their practice. So that's where e engaging in that is not being fair to third parties and is a violation of the RPC. Um, as, as sanctions, I'll close with this, and <clears throat> you don't report because we think there's going to be suspension or disbarment, but in, under the RPCs there's, a, there, there's an allowance for diversion. So diversion might come in the form of compassionate uh, uh, meetings where uh, the person who has been reported would, in fact, come in and talk about their conduct and the person making the report uh, could join the bar and get involved in those meetings about help educate lawyers laterally about what that conduct is and how it's impacting the profession and other members of the bar. So. If you think that this is too aspirational um, in terms of wh where, what our future looks like, we were a no-fault state. I mean, we were a fault state, now we're a no-fault state. Uh, in the 80s, uh, RPC 1.8J was added, the lawyer shall not have sexual relations with the current client of, of the lawyer. So that wasn't in here and, and that got added. So. We've moved away from zealous advocacy. Now, can we move into an area where uh, we treat each other civilly and we as lawyers can generate that sort of lateral uh, or horizontal healing within our own profession? Thank you.